All right, we're going to go ahead and get this thing started. So you'll, you'll have to forgive me. I'm used to doing this on Zoom. It's been a couple of years of being able to just hit mute or being able to draw everyone's attention. So this whole in-person thing is uh, a, a nice and refreshing change. Um, my name is Greg Eisenman, and along with my co-chairs, Gary Marks, Jeffrey Marks, Ryan Halpern, and Daniel Weingarten, uh, we want to thank you for joining us this morning for the first in-person breakfast casual uh, breakfast series since December 2019. Uh, it's crazy that it's been so long, but we're really happy to be back here in person with all of you in the Seelig Center. And just want to thank Federation for this awesome spread and for helping get this, this whole program together. Before we start the panel, though, I want to invite you to watch a brief and meaningful video uh, on behalf of Federation. Every generation of Jews has been both blessed and burdened with the commission of doing what is necessary in their times for the survival of our people. We are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a people that has known tragedy, a people that has brought about miracles, a people that knows how to fight and how to make peace. We do not have the luxury of despair. We have the opportunity to move forward, to get up again and again and again. That is what Jews do, and that is what we will do together. While others talk, you do. While others curse the darkness, you light a candle. A human being is eternal. Any human being is worthy of my attention, of my love. And therefore, I say it to you, when you enter this world and you say the world is not good today, good, correct it. And if we stand firm, if we are together, if we are together, we won't let the light go out. I plead, don't let the light go out. So as you can see, the theme for this campaign is built for this. Uh, and in this day and age we live in, it could not be more apropos. Um, along with the work we do on a day in and day out basis for federation, um, groups around the federations around the country like ours were built to handle situations that are going on in Ukraine and, and provide support. And to show a specific example, I wanna point out the CEO of Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, Eric Robbins, please stand up. Uh, Eric actually just got back, I don't know, last night or this morning from the border of Poland and Ukraine providing support. So bravo, Eric, and thank you for representing our community in this federation and, and supporting. Sorry, you, you want to go ahead and come up and say a couple words about that? Good morning, everyone. just truly catastrophic happening. Those are people just like you and me that could have like just live in Dunwoody and imagine that you've told that you have 30 minutes to put everything you can carry in a suitcase and leave. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see families like ours all over this country cities all over Poland, I'm sure all over Romania, all over Hungary, both with fathers that are left in the country. And by the way, what was so startling to me is yes, I saw people that were leaving, but 
as we all know, most people are staying. And I can't even imagine what it's like for those that are staying. And yes, a good number of those people are Jewish. A good number of those families are Jewish. You just saw a video about the campaign. Well, let me tell you, those campaign dollars have built an infrastructure in Eastern Europe that is an unbelievable asset right now. There are hotlines set up. They know, the JDC knows where the Jews are. They know their phone numbers. They know where they live. They know their names. It has not been difficult to find out where they are, find out what they need, get help to their homes. That's not something that they created this week. That comes from years of support from you and the rest of this community and Jews around the world to build that infrastructure. Talk about why we have the state of Israel to rescue Jews in need. This is that living. There are people coming now and choosing to go live in Israel. And there is a state that not only will bring them there, but there are people who've come out of that country. They don't even have papers. They don't have passports. <clears throat> Imagine if you were told you had to go and the bank was closed and your passport was at the safe deposit box. You aren't getting it. So there are folks helping them to get what they need to figure out how to enter, leave a country, get into a country, build a new life. That too is from what we have built as a community. You would never be more proud to be a Jew if you were there because you see how we take care of our own. But it doesn't stop there. I met physicians who've come from Israel who were taking care of anybody who needed taken care of. I met at the, at the border, there's nine crossings from, from Ukraine to Poland. There's two big ones. I went to one of the two big ones in, in, in such a, it's such a complex feeling because you're passing old death camps and you're, you know, Lublin and Kelm and you're in this, what was a vibrant Jewish community, but they're on the border right there. The first thing you see is an Israeli flag with Israel aid. And they're not just helping Jews, they're helping anyone that needs help. So we all know what's happening there. I will tell you that it is incredibly unsettling. It is scary. None of us knows how the scenarios will roll out, but as a Jew, you should feel proud and you should feel proud of what we built there. And if this campaign is built for this, that's exactly what's happening. The infrastructure that has been there for all the years that we put there is what's is rescuing Jews and taking care of Jews that are staying in the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I mean, that's incredibly powerful. And at the same time, it gives a little bit of comfort to know that, like you said, the donations and the foundation that's been built is, is doing what it was intended to do and providing that support. So thank you for being a part of that. And we can't thank you enough, uh, those who have made a gift to the campaign this year, uh, for anyone who would like to make a gift to the campaign or specifically make a gift to the Ukraine Fund. Uh, the dedicated to the Ukraine Fund, just write Ukraine Fund on there as well. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the program, but before we do, I first want to introduce Bill Lingenfelter, who is the area president of Regions Bank, and Regions and Bill are valued partners for Federation and are the presenting sponsor of the 2023 Community Mission to Israel. So, Bill? All right. All right. <laughs> And we just thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we are a full service financial institution. Uh, we've got some great customers in the room. For those of you who don't bank with us now, my colleagues, Matt Foxman and David Smith who are here, have new account materials with them to help you uh, 
get in the system. I will just say this. I got asked one question this morning about the bank. With rising rates, are things slowing down? And, and I had to bite my tongue a little bit because, frankly, we think rates are still pretty good. Now, over the next year or two, we'll see. But, yes, we're open for business and happy to help you any way we can. I thank you so much for having us here this morning. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and thanks to Regions as well um, for all your support. Now let's talk about cannabis. I, it, with everything going on in the world, it's, it's kind of hard to make that transition, but this is a very poignant and current topic. So I'm really excited about this panel that we have. And without further ado, I wanna invite our great panelists up to the stage. So we have Jordan Tritt, who is the CEO and founder of the Panther Group. And we have, I guess Jordan, come on up. And then we have Aaron Lopez, who is the Director of Government Affairs for True Leaf Cannabis Corp. And Aaron will tell you a little bit more about his company, as will Jordan, in a moment. And not quite here yet, but we'll be here shortly. Representative, State Representative Mike Walensky, who is the representative for the 79th District, uh, which is North DeKalb County in the House of Representatives in the Georgia General Assembly. Uh, Mike should be here in about 10 or 15 minutes. He had the opportunity to go and speak at the governor's mansion this morning uh, with regards to the subject of Israel. So that's something I know we all are supportive of. So I'm going to come take a seat with you guys and we'll get this party started. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for Looking having forward us. forward to our conversation. It's not lost on me that the pen I had in my briefcase was from a place called Billow. I was out in Colorado a couple of weeks ago. So the ironies never end. <laughs> so just, just I want to start by allowing the group to get to know who you guys are and what you do on a daily basis and kind of why we're here. So Aaron, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your background, your bio. Everyone has a brief bio on the table, um, but what do you do on a daily basis for TrueLeave? And maybe tell us something about that day-to-day -day job that is not in that packet. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. And, and any chance I get to talk about what I do, I, I, I jump at it. Um, I, you know, as you can probably see from my bio, I am a political nerd and have been since about eight years old. I'm just completely involved in, in the political system and just the opportunity to have a voice and give others a voice um, is, is amazing to me. And about six, seven years ago, Virginia was looking to start up the, the program uh, just for what it is. We're looking at it for children with epilepsy. Um, what it does for them, and they were looking at bringing in that medical program. Um, and it took me back, and the main reason I got into it was I was already in the pharmacy world and helping a lot of pharmacists out with who I was represented, and they kind of asked me to help them navigate this. But I had a father who, in the early 80s, had a ski accident, fractured both bones in his lower leg, and through a blood transfusion got the AIDS virus as before they were testing for it. And I also had a mother or stepmom who later in life developed bone cancer, very excruciating, very painful. Both of whom, which this would have helped them. It, I, I do not make a claim it would have cured them at all but it would have made their quality of life better. And I will tell you, being in California at the time, especially for my stepmom in the early 2000s, we were able to get a couple of edibles for her, just a chocolate. And we were able to get her off of the hardcore painkillers that she was on. And I got mom back for a while. Both my parents had passed away. And as I said, I didn't think that this would cure them, but I know it would have made their life better. And having very strong religious views, it was, you know, this medical thing, I can get behind this. And so there in Virginia, uh, we poured all of our efforts into it to making sure that it was available. Um, we did the same thing in West Virginia. So I've been able to see the program start from, from first questions and asking about it 
up to actual implementations. And it, that's kind of been my, my mission with this, is being able to give patients access to a, a program that for the longest time has been stigmatized as something evil. And, and we're gonna talk a lot about that today and how to continue to create that access. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Jordan, what about you? Tell us about your background. Yeah, so I'm, a, as I say, I'm the few and the proud of native Atlantan. Uh, grew up uh, in Dunwoody. Yes, a lot of us here. Um, I went to uh, Michigan. I've always been uh, kind of going down that business track. So I spent uh, about 10 years in different uh, startups. So I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Um, this is a uh, industry. Hey, Michael. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, just in time. Uh, so this is an industry that, that consists of a lot of early stage companies. So uh, in 2016, I went out. Uh, actually, I'm a uh, different story than many people. So my dad actually brought me into the cannabis industry. He started investing in 2013. Uh, I got uh, involved in 2016, really fell in love with the industry and the people. Um, you know, very few people come from the cannabis background. So it's mostly a uh, industry of, uh, of transplants. So uh, everyone, you know, similar to Aaron, you know, a lot of times have a, have a, uh, a personal story that got them into it uh, or some sort of, uh, you know, real passion for it. So I, I love that, um, you know, the why behind it. Uh, so uh, started out uh, on the investing side in 2016. We're on our second uh, venture capital fund. And then in 2020, saw a need across the industry to provide a bunch of uh, key supporting services as these companies uh, grew. So I, um, you know, started an advisory firm with uh, a co-founder um, and uh, have several of our employees here, Erica and Michael in the back. So I know they do a very good job of introducing themselves, but feel free to uh, introduce yourselves. They can't open a bank account for you, but they can uh, <laughs> tell you about investing in cannabis. Uh, I will say one thing that's not on my background is uh, my dear friend, Kenny, back there. He, he uh, you know, I guess cut it off a little bit at the head, but Kenny was my basketball coach back in eighth grade. So that ages him a little bit. So I feel, uh, you know, I'd be remiss to not mention that. So th those are back in the days when I was an athlete. Based on my experience with Kenny, I think I might be the only one in the room that he didn't coach in basketball. <laughs> so <laughs> just to be clear about that. Thank you, Jordan. And, and Mike, Michael Lensky is the, again, the representative from the 79th district, uh, North DeKalb County in the, in the House of Representatives. Glad you could make it. Thank you. Um, you made it just in time to hit the first question. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background professionally, and how you ended up on the stage talking about uh, the, the cannabis movement. Thank you all for having me. Uh, I was born in Piedmont. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but born and raised, in Saint, in, uh, born and raised here. Uh, went to Hebrew Academy. Kenny was my basketball coach. I was the point guard. Um, and uh, yeah, so I have an uh, injury wrongful death law firm. And in 2018, I ran for office. And I was elected to House District 79. And uh, out of 180 state reps, we actually only have about 25 attorneys. Uh, which is a lot less than we think, and uh, we need more attorneys. Um, but I'm also right now the only Jewish person in the whole Georgia legislature, both the House and Senate. Um, I guess no one here decided to run last week, but uh, we do have two Jewish people running, which is good, one Democrat, one Republican. I, in the House, uh, I sit on the Judiciary Committee, Regulated Industries, which is why I'm here, Intergovernmental Coordination and Budget and Fiscal Affairs, Budget and Fiscal Affairs, no bills goes through there. It just sounds good. Um, but I uh, became on the Regulated Industries in 2020 committee, and that's where all regulated industry bills go through, anything from massage to tattoos to fireworks to alcohol beverage to cannabis. And so I have seen every bill, and I've become very close with Chairman Powell, the chairman of Regulated Industries, and uh, spent a lot of time in his office and heard many, many conversations about uh, the bills and the industry. And so that's how I've become a part of this. And if you ever need anything or have any questions or want to run for office in 2024, let me know. Give me a call. Thank you, Mike. And I have a feeling you're going to get all the hard questions today. And these guys are going to get the easy questions. So saddle up. I'll, I want to start by talking a little bit about the background of this industry in the United States. Uh, Jordan, can you tell us a little bit about when 
when there was first conversation of legalization of, of cannabis in any form and kind of where that started and how it's progressed a little bit. And then I'm going to go to Aaron to talk about kind of where we stand right now nationally. Yeah. So from a medical standpoint, at this point, there's uh, 38, I mean, who knows, maybe 39 after this morning. It's hard to keep track, but there are close to 40 states. So, you know, the vast majority of states, uh, we're actually, you know, one of the few uh, who have not passed a uh, medical cannabis law. It started in 1996 with California, and uh, there really wasn't much happening up until like 2012 when uh, states like Washington and Colorado and Oregon uh, first passed, and then they started legal sales in 2014. Uh, my co-founder actually got into the cannabis space from the political side. He helped legalize cannabis in Alaska um, through uh, supporting uh, political candidates and uh, organizations like marijuana policy project. Um, when I got involved in 2016, that election, there were nine uh, legislative uh, uh, bills up at the state level and eight out of nine passed for medical and for recreational or adult use. So that was really a significant turning point uh, for the industry back in 2016. And at this point, like I mentioned, almost 40 states uh, have passed it medicinally and close to 20 states have passed it uh, for adult use. So this is, uh, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. This is uh, not going back. So uh, more and more states, uh, you know, no, I've spent uh, some time up in the Northeast. New York is, is moving very quickly right now. New Jersey has passed, Connecticut. Uh, so we're about to have, you know, 30 million more uh, people in the U.S. that are going to have access to adult use. And Mike, I think you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, just one quick thing going back, way back in history, what's interesting, if you look when alcohol was becoming legalized in our country, you know, why is it so hard to legalize marijuana? Well, if you look at the testimony in Congress, it is incredibly disgusting is the word, but the reason that what happened is they said alcohol is for people like us, but marijuana is for those people and it's a really bad thing. And, and that's when it all started and that narrative has never changed. So that is why we see it so hard, uh, especially with the majority party here in Georgia. And that narrative has never changed where uh, we all know that marijuana is incredibly helpful and good and can save lives. For furthering on that, I mean, how, how did that topic gain some sort of traction and legitimacy in the Georgia state legislature? Is it just, is it pressure from across the country or, or how did you guys get to the point where you're like, we're actually voting on something? Uh, in terms of how do we get to the point where actually something came around. So that was uh, Micah Gravely and who was the uh, peak? Alan Peak. Alan Peak. Yeah. yeah, represented Micah Gravely, represented Alan Peak about eight years ago, learned about a child in their district who literally was committing a federal crime by getting cannabis oil over state lines. Uh, well, her parents were doing that. She is bound to wheelchair and has severe seizures. And they met this child. And then they learned that there's all these other children who have a severe seizure disorder and other disorders with cannabis oil that this little thing can make their lives so much easier for them and their parents. And they're like, why can't we do this? And that was the beginning. And that, and they worked, it took them six years to even get a bill passed that dealt with cannabis oil, not even marijuana, but that's what led it. it led, and that's what usually happens in the legislatures. Somebody meets somebody in a condition or a business in a situation and, and it's a personal connection that makes that happen. So that's, that's how it started. And, and we're going to dive more into the specifics about Georgia in a minute. But Aaron, can you talk a little bit about what, what True Leave is and, and where you guys are involved and active across the country before we dive more deeply yeah, into Yeah, so I will tell you that uh, before yesterday, True Leave was the, the nation's largest medical cannabis company in, in the country. Uh, but uh, there was a merger announced yesterday where... Uh, Columbia Care and Cresco are, are about to merge. And I think right now you're starting to see a lot of consolidation in the industry, uh, just as things start to become at a national level. And it, it, it was this patchwork from state to state to state. And there was a land grab, you know, with these companies just trying to get a foothold in every single state. Truly took a different approach. And they started five, six years ago in Florida stayed in Florida. Uh, currently, we have about 55% of the market share down there. It's about 500,000 patients um, that are in the state. We have about 100 dispensaries in the state, by far our, our largest footprint of anywhere. Once we figured that we've learned how to do this, 
we decided from there to go ahead and start to spread out. And through different acquisitions and different growth and applications, we're now in about 11 states. Um, and with that solid base in Florida, it's, it's allowed us to gain that experience and move that experience to other places. But as I said, you're gonna to start to see this consolidation and uh, across the country. Um, I think even within uh, the state of Georgia, you'll see fairly quickly, you know, some of that happening as well. And let's talk a little bit more about that because I know, Mike, I'm going to have you tell us a little bit about what we are actually working with right now in Georgia. Uh, my understanding is there have been some provisional licenses that were awarded. Uh, they haven't been necessarily issued yet. There's some ongoing challenges. Um, and, and I believe that number six, but I've heard that that number could grow significantly. And we're talking about consolidation, but in Georgia, it, it's kind of the opposite. So Mike, just to give us a base, a base, tell us what is currently legal in Georgia and what ongoing discussions are right now to the extent that you can. Okay. So, um, right now in Georgia, six licenses have been given. Uh, to companies to manufacture and distribute cannabis oil. And that went through the Regulated Industries Committee and then went out to the commission who did a whole, what would you call it, a test? Or the, the R R R RFP. an RFP went out and yeah. people, now what yeah. we learned through a committee hearing at the beginning of the year, and when I looked back at the video, I actually asked the head of the commission for 13 minutes questions. Um, but it turned out uh, Chair Powell said, hey, ask me some questions. and. At, in the committee when they say, hey, who has a question? I was the only one, I'm a Democrat, and I saw none of the Republicans are raising their hands. So I was like, okay. Anyway, so I asked them all these questions. What we learned from those questions was through this RFP, actually through the law that was, everything that was, all of the information gathered was pretty much confidential. So he wasn't allowed to answer pretty much anything for 13 minutes. And that's one of the biggest problems. What we have is the whole, the whole system that they use is confidential. So that was the first problem. So we ended up with, uh, six licenses being sent out. Um, where we're at now is a House bill passed that would, so a bill can either start in the House or the Senate. So the bill that passed the House most recently would start the whole process over. Now, what's interesting, what got slipped in is it also said that a Georgia legislature could own 5% of a company. That's interesting. Anyways, and so then on the Senate side, hold on, I got to look at my notes. On the Senate side, um, they passed a bill that said the six licenses that were given, we need to let them move forward immediately on May 31st, 2022. The problem with that is if they move forward, all of the people who appealed are going to file lawsuits. And based on what we've seen in Florida and other states, it will be held up in courts for three years. So the next option is, there's two options, is the Cannabis Commission can, they have a meeting today, actually, can uh, choose. They postpone it until next week. They have a meeting next week. <laughs> Um, and they can decide to start the whole process over. If they decide to start the whole process over based on what I've been told, it seems that that will get rid of any possibility of lawsuits he may disagree. Um, <laughs> but that, they have that option. The other option that could, what happens when it pass, a bill passes the House, goes to the Senate or goes opposite the Senate House and gets changed, it comes back for an agree, disagree vote. If you disagree, it can then be put in what's called a conference committee, where there's a selected groups of representatives and senators who decide what that law is going to be. And so it may go into a conference committee. And the option that Chairman Powell has been saying is let's give the six licenses and then let's also give to everybody who appealed because those are the people who would have standing for a lawsuit, which is 16, now 22 licenses. Let's give those all out as well. And that let's get this moving forward. And 22 licenses for the state of Georgia probably isn't even enough. That's not a lot um, based on how much cannabis oil we need for medicine and other needs. Um, but that, that's about where we are right now. We're in limbo. Forgive me for asking, but it sounds like this is a little bit hazy, this whole process. Uh, <laughs> you just teed that one up. <laughs> um, Aaron, yeah. will we, we you tell us a little bit more specifically about True Leaves' involvement in Georgia? Because it'd be great if we could talk to somebody who was issued one of those licenses. Yes. And you guys were. Yeah, we're not as excited about the starting over as, as maybe <laughs> others might be. Um, and, and I will tell you that I, I agree that some of the... Uh, information and keeping it as confidential. I think that the commission took it to an extreme that they, they should not have. There were questions that were asked that should have easily been answered. But what that confidentially allowed us to do is put in our applications proprietary stuff to show what we can do. And if that information were to get out, 
all another company would have to do is say, ah, okay. You know, and I mean, we talk about blends of material and uh, nutrients and different things that we added into that uh, application. Uh, starting it over, you're looking at anywhere between another 18 months to three years to getting, the, getting it going again. Um, and I'm not, the, the commission has every right to, to do that. Uh, it, and starting it over would most likely uh, see lawsuits just because we have it, we've invested money, we started clearing land, we started doing a bunch of other purchases and preparations because we're told you need to be ready to go. You've got a deadline of a year as soon as that issue, that contract is signed by you guys to get up and running. So we've had to do things ahead of time. There's a couple that are already built out completely ready to go as soon as uh, you're given the green light to do it. So it's going to be kind of difficult uh, to do that. And I will say just a small clarity on the Senate bill, it actually just says the process has to start by May 31st. It doesn't actually grant the six the things. So it just basically says the protest period has to be over by then, finish the hearings, get to move it. It doesn't actually guarantee us, I wish it did, and I might have, I should have put that more in a note in, in that Senate bill, but it, it, a, it, it's something that we need to look at, and I get that there's things are going. I will tell you, we are about 20,000 patients on the registry right now that have been waiting for a couple of years for, for this program to get started. Uh, the number of licenses that were issued, there were two licenses that were issued for a 100,000 square feet build uh, of grow. And we were one of those, and then four licenses for 50,000 square feet. One of the 100,000 square foot licenses could probably handle 200,000 patients because of the program that we have here in Georgia. So I think you're right with 11 million people here in the state, if I'm, if I'm right with the number. Um, I think there will be a potential in a time uh, where more licenses will be needed, but I think more than anything, we need a program that gets up and running soon because you've got patients waiting, you've got kids waiting, and I think we need to start that process. So just to clarify on the on the growth allowances under the licenses issue, so you're saying the tier the tier two licenses at 50k each and the tier ones at 100k each. So that's what, 300,000 square feet of, of growth allowed in the entire state, right? Am I understanding that correctly? So basically take two Walmarts, put them together, and that's that's the entirety of the growth operation that's permitted in Georgia under what's been what's been issued, or yes. issued provisionally. Um, I hear a lot about uncertainty and, and delay in the, in the process potentially. That can't be good from an investor standpoint. So Jordan, tell us a little bit about how you view the process from your from what you're doing and um, you know, what's y'all's involvement in Georgia right now versus other states? Yeah, so uh, as you can tell, this is a very complex industry. Um, there's a lot going on. This is just one state, you know, let alone you know, after if they could pass the state level, then they're going to get to the local level and oftentimes towns and cities can opt out and all this. So there's, and then you got, you know, where facilities can be located and all this. So it takes a very long time to get things working. California, not, not to mention it's still illegal federally. Yeah. So, you know, crossing state lines and different things. So it's a, a pretty yeah. hard, yeah. especially from a financial aspect. Yeah, of it, yes. exactly. Exactly. So um, along those lines, when we got invested, when we first started investing in this industry in 2014, all of the companies we invested in were, were not plant touching businesses. They were, there's an entire industry. Uh, I think there's probably like 400,000 people employed in this industry right now. Uh, and many of them are, you know, in software, technology, banking, compliance, packaging, et cetera. So there's, uh, you know, kin it to the you know, gold rush there are a lot of companies doing the picks and shovels of this industry. So that's where we started. So there's a whole industry that you can focus on that is much less uh, regulatorily, you know, uh, uh, restrained, like what we're talking about here. So that's a focus. Certainly, um, you know, each state is its own uh, market, as we've talked about. So we started investing in California, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and now have moved. The green wave has kind of gone east. Uh, Georgia, frankly, is not, you know, we're based here, but, you know, we have, 
you know, nothing going on in Georgia because, you know, there's nothing to do. I mean, well, these guys figure out their arguments, <laughs> you know, we'll just continue to invest um, in other areas. So that's where we're at. So you'll get here eventually. Yeah, eventually. Uh, Don't hold your breath. <laughs> I want it. There's so, so many places to go with that. Um, I want to talk about public perception a little bit on this issue. Um, I, I think historically people look at, or some people look at, at using cannabis or marijuana as doing drugs versus other people look at it as a fun leisurely activity, an opportunity to get medication or relief, or other people just kind of view it similarly to, to the way that they view consumption of alcohol. So Aaron, will you educate the group a little bit about the, the products that you guys offer and, and the types of remedies that they provide, whether it's actually medicinal, physical, uh, mental health or, or whatnot? So I, I will tell you, just start off that uh, there's every, several of the surveys that have gone out when discussing the medical side of Canada, you've got about a 90% approval rating across the country uh, of doing that. And the surprising fact, I told you about my, my father and my stepmom, but uh, my mother, who is 80 years old, the weirdest question is getting a call from her and her asking me what she should take. And uh, I'm not your dealer, uh, you need to call your doctor and, and kind of work it. She's in Southern California, and, and so she needs to, to walk through that. But when you think of my mother, I want you to picture that that's really closer to our median patient level. We, you, you walk into any one of our, our pharmacies or dispensaries, our patients are not 20 year olds, 30 year olds. You're looking between 45 and 65 as our median range of, of patient age. Why? Well, because some of those ailments they feel that helps them out the best, the, the chronic pain and other injuries and life, things that have helped them out. Uh, as for products here in Georgia, what has been allowed is oil-based products. So you'll get, um, you'll get tinctures, you'll get pills, you'll get other things that you can take orally. I think I just, oh, there you go. Um, in other states, you'll see the dry flour available. You'll see uh, the use of being able to smoke it versus vape it. And it really is to hit different patients. And... It's fascinating coming from a pharmacy background with a bunch of the people that I represent, how each one of those drugs medically work. Um, I get a lot of questions like, well, what is a dummy going to do for me? And I go, well, it all depends on how you, you want to take it and what you're doing for it. Most of the times what you'll see is somebody is, is taking an oral dose for a chronic injury or chronic pain to help manage something on a daily level. But if something flares up and it hits them right away, nothing will hit you faster than a rape uh, use of it. That'll, it'll take effect in about 30 minutes, but it also have a much shorter lifespan in your body as opposed to something that you take orally, which will take longer to get to it, but it'll also last longer in the body. So working with a doctor and with your local pharmacy dispensary, you'll be able to really manage a lot of what ails. And, and can you clarify a little bit compared to what your overall offering is, you know, across the footprint of your, your operation, what specifically is going to be allowed in Georgia and how will that product differ, at least initially? Yeah, so it'll only be orally, uh, oral products. So it'll be whether liquid form uh, or a tab or something that, that you can swallow. I, though, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't, lotions and creams and other things like that are, have not been, have been approved. Yeah, it would just be cannabis oil orally, and also they only allow it for 14 diagnosed disease. Correct. One of them is uh, Crohn's, and my bill last year was to add ulcerative colitis, because Crohn's right. and colitis are the same, and a senator stripped my bill, that means he wiped it. I wasn't happy about that, but they actually added it into the House bill. So there's only fifth would be 14 or 15 diseases that it could be used for. And I'll just add real quickly that um, there's been tons of evidence is showing for soldiers, military people, PTSD, and then for members of tribe anxiety. Correct. And, but, you know, really for mental diseases that uh, it really has a very big significance with the use very well. That should have gotten a better laugh. I know, that was group. good. I, I had that, that was in my phone. I mean, come good. on, y'all. 
Mike, can you talk a little bit more about just the perception of this issue within the GA? I mean, is, is there, are there strict party line divides on, on how they view the, the subject? I mean, Aaron was saying that nationally there's a 90% favorable uh, response to this, but I'm just curious what you deal with from a political standpoint. And we're not trying to dive too much into individual politics. I just want to know kind of yeah. how it plays out. Yeah, I mean, along party lines, it's very simple. Um, the Georgia majority Republicans are very, you would say, old school Republicans and, and have always believed that alcohol is okay and marijuana is very, very bad for, you know, could be going back to, like I said, those congressional hearings back in the day. But, you know, they just believe it's, I mean, literally people show up in the hallways telling me that this is the devil's work. Um, and and uh, that's just the view where uh, Democrats, I think, um, understand the medical benefits and, and in general um, are in favor of legalizing marijuana, if not just cannabis oil. Do you feel like on, on the right side of the aisle that's starting to change, though, as some of the old school, uh, as you said, the old school Republicans maybe phase out or retire and some of the newer new, new school Republicans, is there more support or are they just are they it, it's strictly party line? Well, especially with the new redistricting of lines in Georgia, uh, all but two seats in Georgia on the House are competitive in the general election, meaning every seat, whether Democrat or Republican, will be decided in the primary. The problem with that is you end up with who's going to run further to their party. So that means in terms of marijuana specifically, you know, people who run for office, I can assure you a Republican who says they want to legalize cannabis oil or marijuana will not win the primary. So that's what we're dealing with, especially with the redistricting lines going on for the next, we do it every 10 years, that uh, unfortunately, in Georgia, and that's something I spoke out a lot, is we need to have competitive general elections, not primaries for that reason, so we get more moderates. But unfortunately, uh, the lines is drawn where we'll deal with uh, further leaning to each party, and so that may slow it down. I, I would say unless the, uh, unless the House flips to Democrat. I'm just saying just, that's based on population, not based on you – know, So because yeah. so, I'm dealing with this at the – you know, across the entire country, like Georgia is, is really an outlier – you know, when you look at this across, this is not a red or blue issue across the United States. It may be here in Georgia, but as a whole, this is more of a young and old issue as more of the older politicians. I mean, look at our president, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's not in favor of this and yet he's extremely progressive. So, um, you know, at the same time, like as more of the older people, uh, you know, retire the younger people come on this is an issue that is again uh pretty across party line that that's a good point i mean that's something i was wondering and it, it's it's ironic given that the target demographic for a lot of these products is is an older demographic but it's the younger demographic that's very pro you know i, I would almost say laissez-faire about the issue of of uh legalizing cannabis Jordan, I was going to ask you, just going back to the perception question, mm -hmm. how do you get investors comfortable? Are, are these niche investors who are like, we're really gung-ho on this industry, so they're coming to you? Or are you having to go out and, and sell potential investors and, and really get them comfortable with kind of the status of it federally and it not being legal federally and, and getting them comfortable going into individual states? So five years ago is more of what you're talking about, having to get people comfortable uh, nowadays, I think, uh, you know, I attend a lot of family office conferences, uh, second to uh, crypto and NFTs, cannabis is the most, uh, you know, exciting topic uh, in terms of alternative asset classes. So, uh, but again, you know, it's, it's interesting being in a room in Georgia because it's, you know, this panel wouldn't exist in other states because it, this was, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago that they passed this. So we're in Georgia, you know, very far behind. So in terms of locally, it's still a lot of education, uh, getting people comfortable. Uh, like I said, you know, a lot of our investments don't actually touch the plant. Um, but, you know, across the board, uh, many people have kind of gotten over it. Um, you know, that's what I would say. Okay. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about where we're going. And, and again, I want to stick to Georgia. I hear what you're saying. Is this whole movement of the low THC or passing licenses or issuing licenses for the low THC product, is this all just basically a road to getting to a point of adult consumption, which in layman's terms, that means the legalization of recreational marijuana use? Um, do you feel like that's where we're headed? Or do you think that once it passes in the GA with the low THC product that it's kind of where it's going to stay? 
Mike. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> if, if I were to guess in the future, uh, so the Senate's going to stay Republican. The, the Georgia House at some point uh, by the end of, you know, getting close to 2030 could switch to Democrat just based on population, um, based on the drawing of the lines, always known as gerrymandering. That may not happen. Um, so as a starting point, it sort of matters if Democrats take over the House. Um, and then, you know, I think once cannabis oil starts being produced and we start seeing the medical benefits, um, that would be good progress. But in terms of um, Southern Republicans in Georgia, um, I, I just think marijuana is seen as a really, really bad thing. And it may be an age thing. I mean, real, uh, if you look at the Republicans who are elected, they are, I mean, they got to be average in their 60s at least. So, I mean, it could be over time and uh, maybe as other states and, um, you know, depending on who our governor is and, and all that, there's no way of guessing, but um, yeah, it's a difficult thing. It's just a really difficult thing. Well, it's an interesting conversation to me also because you look at Florida. I mean, Aaron, Aaron said before, you guys have, what, 100 dispensaries in Florida, which, you know, politically is, is also a little bit to the right of center, and, and they're a lot further along. So why would you say Georgia specifically is behind some of our neighboring states? Because we're special. <laughs> yeah. So, so, the, so let me say, so you, we, to, to your question, you know, Florida has been medical for years, and probably will not go wreck for another couple years. Um, and there is a, a pretty hard line that uh, drawn. And, and I'm not going to disparage Georgia, you know, in the sense that, you know, you do have something on the books. It is time to move forward with the original six um, that were awarded. <laughs> um, and, you know, you still have states like North Carolina, South Carolina, that are still contemplating bills. And, you know, uh, both are working on these bills in the Senate. Uh, you've got other states around you that have, you know, even wilder programs that, that are fairly dysfunction, dysfunctional. Um, so I, I think the program and the, the, the path that George has, you know, it, the potential is there to have a really good program. It is limited. And I think before you, you start thinking of REC, where, what you would think of is, okay, maybe we open it to more medical conditions. We open up to other available products uh, and other dosage forms. And I think that's where you would go before you'd even consider a rec. And I think a lot of the, the legislators here know that while they're still here, they're going to control it. One more thing I'll add is, as we see other products come on the market, like Delta 8, we had a bill come through regulated industries. I mean, Delta 8 is horrible in the sense that we have high school children buying these pens, and you, there's nothing listed on these things, what's, it, what are the, what's inside. And, and that's the scariest thing, as more products come on the shelf that get them to have that feeling or get people and, and make them feel good. I think that at some point will possibly lead to legalizing marijuana because at least we know what it is Correct. and can label it. And Correct. It's Correct. Well, and, and, and and can you, I was going to say, can you talk a little bit more about, and I don't want to dive too deep into it because I saw there was a bunch of news this week on Delta 8 and, and some specific action on the floor. I don't know if it was in committee or on the general floor, but uh, can you just elaborate a little bit yeah. what is delta 8 tell you what if I, if I can give a little bit of what it is and then if you want to talk about the, the legend so delta 8 is a byproduct of of hemp and what they found out is hemp came out really big because you can get cbd from it and that's what it was that's what was driving it and all the other products you can make from the stock um and what they found out is oh my goodness the federal government did not disallow Delta 8 or Delta 10 or any of these others, they specifically called out Delta 9, which is, which is the THC that we're all familiar with. Well, to get Delta 8 out of hemp, it is a very laborious pro uh, project and you have to add all these other things. I wouldn't even consider it a natural product just because the way they have to do it, it's more of a synthetic product that you're getting. So it's, it, it, that has another complications to it. And you can get it from your local sip and go to your there is issue that you, you can't, it is outside of uh, regulation. You see states all over the place really now starting to dial that back in and say, no, we're going to put that on a controlled substance and not allow that. I was going to say, will you, because I think there was some conversation yeah. specifically about that. Well, it may, it may have been the bill that also might have went through the house, regulated industries and all that, that it is starting to force those companies to label and state what is the Delta-8. And as he said, it's really complex because it's a scientific method to form something. 
So, I mean, in time, I mean, we're just going to have all these Delta products, but if we're going to have that, then Delta 9 marijuana, um, that's the most, would, would you agree, natural. It's straight from the plant Correct. and there's no process except the plant. And so there, there is all that benefit. So there's just so much change. And as, I mean, as more companies figure out uh, how to do loop arounds and make money off, unfortunately, our children, high schoolers in college and all of that by selling these products that aren't labeled. I mean, the state has to do something and hopefully they'll realize and learn the safest thing is to legalize marijuana. What are the chances that something comes down federally, whether it's legit legitimization from a banking standpoint, or I, I, I don't know, maybe this is not ever going to happen, but I want you guys to know, would, would the federal government ever legalize it and just say, we're fine with the states doing whatever they want? Kind of how, how would that pro where are we with that? Is there any legislation along those lines? And how could that potentially play out, Aaron? So you're, you're going to see here in about a month, uh, Senator Schumer's bill where, where that he's been pushing pretty hard. Everything, every other bill out there has pretty much froze uh, waiting for Schumer to put his bill out. It's a fairly com complex bill in that it doesn't just deal uh, with the legalization um, of it, but it uh, helping those that have suffered from the war on drugs, and there's a whole bunch of different aspects to it. Um, but I think there are a lot of unintended consequences from a, federal, a rushed federal bill that were, that were, a lot of people want it at a federal level. I don't know if we're ready for it at a federal level. And I, and I don't know if the mix uh, to, to the discussion, the Democrat, Republican, old, young, I don't know if that mix is there in Congress yet to actually drive that through. So you'll hear a lot of discussions dealing with banking issues because that's something that helps everybody. What I don't think people understand is that I can't take normal write-offs for the company that other companies get to because of a 2TE tax issue on it. I basically pay 70% of everything in taxes because I can't write off um, you know, wear and tear on businesses, losses, or anything of that nature, all that just has to be eaten, eaten by, the, by the company because of the war on drug issues from the um, 80s and, and 90s. How does this all factor in for you guys as investors? I mean, hearing that, that's obviously you know, the, the issue with the write-offs and taxes. That impacts the bottom line for companies that you're investing in. Um, just talk a little bit about that and also where you see things going over the next couple of years from, as an investor. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, that you know, the, the industry breaking up into ancillary and plant touching, what uh, Aaron is describing affects the plant touching businesses. It does not affect the software technology businesses. So that's a reason why um, also, you know, we talk about each market. Right, your software can apply to 50 different states, multiple countries. So that's why we've heavily focused on the ancillary side. Um, you know, I can tell you right now, I mean, you know, like Puerto Rico has operations and Puerto Rico is not subject to the same 280E. So when, and as we saw, you know, outlying Delta 9 gives rise to Delta 8. So, uh, you know, the industry is uh, creative and so there are ways around and um, you know, different ways to maximize your, you know, uh, after-tax profit. So we're, you know, that's part of our approach is to provide the strategic advisory and a lot of the connections and uh, contacts of people who understand, you know, the multiple facets of this industry and try to, you know, figure out a way to operate most efficiently and profitably. Well, and I think to, to, to Jordan's point is that, well, we are a massive company we still rely on so many other sources. I mean, we, we need containers, we need trucks, we need vehicles, we need, um, you know, there's delivery services, there's the ITs and computers, we need uh, electrical systems and buildings. And, and there are so many ancillary businesses out there, uh, real estate that, that touch our industry, that it's not just some kid in a basement anymore in his mom's basement with uh, a few plants. I mean, these are multi-state corporations. And I would say security and compliance Correct. and all that as well. Yes, yeah. I mean, the camera systems in our, in, in our facilities alone, you know, to, to that point, we now have a tracking software because the, the states are regulating that can track somebody that walking through our stores and if they get flagged, by the state, we can flag them when they enter another uh, another one of our stores, and that's. I mean, 
every square inch of our buildings have to be covered by a camera. Uh, and, and just because of the security levels. And, and we're running it up against time, and ultimately I want to get it out to everyone in case there are any questions. But to the point you were just making, so do you guys have to isolate different parts of your business, whether it's logistics or trucking, so that you can take advantage of normal tax, you know, tax code and keep the cannabis side separate, or how do you approach it? Yeah, that's a... Or, or is that, is that, don't ask how the sausage is made, just thing. enjoy it. CFO question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You shouldn't be talking about That's above about my that. pay grade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> but not for his company, yeah, yeah, other companies. Yeah. Fair enough. And then, and then from a payment yeah, standpoint, I mean, I know in a lot of places, uh, dispensaries don't take credit cards again because of the banking issue. Um, does that total, does that create a lot more risk from a, a cash standpoint? If you're having to handle a bunch of cash and, how do you deposit it? And uh, again, I don't, we don't need to get into the specifics of that, but maybe talk about the difficulties. Well, to Jordan's point, I mean, there, people are creative. New, new services have popped up all over the place for security service to transport uh, the, the cash. And I mean, the funny thing is, is that, you know, the federal government was not ready to take, I mean, they still charge us taxes. I mean, they were illegal, but they still want their money. Yeah. Um, and Imagine and the that. Federal Reserves, you know, had to develop and they developed it very quickly for a way for us to de deliver large lumps of cash to them. Yep. And but so you, you adapt to do that. The problem and uh, I, I don't know if the Regents Bank is still here with it, but we've had a lot of banks close on us when they do it because of the fear they, they would call us up and tell us you have one week to get all your funds out of the account you know so how we pay our um employees we do different things especially we're a large corporation so we've we've got access to a bunch of different it's the small guys that suffer probably the largest from these financial restrictions on them so one, one last thing jordan before we go into a q a if anyone in here in the room or in the community at large wants to get into investing in this industry, short of just saying, just call Jordan. Um, what are some Thank ways, you very what, much. What, Appreciate what, it. What are some ways that the individual investor can start pushing some money into this industry? Um, yeah. So actually we work on um, a, a number of creative solutions again. So crowdfunding is a way where you can dip your toe in. Uh, into companies. We've got uh, multiple companies raising money through crowdfunding, certainly, uh, you know, through a, a diversified approach uh, from a fund strategy standpoint is another way. Um, you yeah, know, I mean, I think those are a couple of the, the low hanging fruit uh, ways. Awesome. Anything else you guys want to add before I open it up? All right, guys, we've got five or so minutes. Take a couple questions. If anybody has them, just raise your hand and yell it out. Jason. Uh, Jordan, I'd like to ask you as, as the entrepreneur here, I've seen kind of state regulation and kind of what we said Comcast and marijuana. Um, where do you see? I like that. I might yeah, use that. To make sure it's not compromised through the as the only still work with marijuana. Um, I'm not sure if I. Uh, quite understand. I could just say, I, it, I don't know if this answers the question, but- Are you asking how to keep it from becoming monopolized? What is the entrepreneur view of how can't be, I mean, being a state house and have the regulations that has this road mm -hmm. what, what needs to be done to make sure that it's working? Well, it's not working. Got it. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, you look at uh, like New York right now, New York is like to the um, extreme in terms of making sure that social equity, economic empowerment is happening. The state announced a $200 million fund. Uh, only The only applicants that can apply are people who have past convictions, um, you know, of marijuana offenses. So there's a lot of, you know, good approach in terms of opening it up to people who have been disadvantaged, uh, you know, by being in the, you know, the legacy or illicit market. Um, there's certainly, it makes sense. This is an industry like the CPG industry and a, you know, a healthcare industry like other ones. So you're going to need the scale of bigger corporations. So I think the alcohol, where that's going to end up is you're going to have big companies and you're going to have like the craft 
uh, people. And then certainly within this industry, because of the past, there's going to be a social justice, economic empowerment. So all of that needs to be factored in. Um, you know, we've got, like we talked about the patchwork, there's multiple states that have done it somewhat right. You know, some have done it better than others. So ideally, you know, there would be a way to learn from some, you know, some of the, the more uh, efficient operating markets right now, but certainly probably, you know, including more of the economic empowerment, social equity components as well. I think a blend of those two things is, is the ideal way to make this industry move forward. So what I just heard was that uh, if you got arrested in college for some sort of marijuana related offense, you might actually have a leg up on everybody else if you ultimately want to get into in New York. In New York. You had to have been arrested. In New York. In New York. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was yeah. out there. And I not saw- just arrested. Also, you know, you need to have it convicted and, and all that. So if you thought you got out, you know, by so if you thought you had a good someone, lawyer, it yeah. didn't actually well, help you. And, and, and to Jordan's point, the reason why New York is it is because it's a bifurcated system. If you own a grow and processing unit, you're not allowed to own the uh, dispenser. Yeah, it. and you can only own a level of three. And and on that note, in Georgia, the way our we are one of the few left that on the alcohol level, you can only be a distributor, um, a seller, or a maker. Right. And if we get to the point where marijuana um, gets to that point, our, and regulated industries committee is still the same way, marijuana could be in that vein as well uh, here in Georgia. So, I saw we had a couple other questions. That's the most shocking thing to me. I mean, I've always said, why don't we just tell companies you can't have tobacco fields in Georgia and have them all be marijuana fields, which is a much better option to me. But yeah, the fact that we keep saying we need to figure out new forms of way to bring money into the state, and this is such a logical, rational step, why is it has moved forward? I'm confused as well. Well, right now, because of, you know, you would think that COVID would have had a different impact on it, but so many states are so flush with money because of the grants that have been given that that's not an argument. It was three years ago, and it probably will be in a couple of years when that money's out. Hmm. Um, uh, but you got states like Pennsylvania and some of these others that were looking at it for that reason. West Virginia was looking at it for that reason, but they're fairly flush with money and they're in the black right now. Um, but that will yeah. come back up. He's right. We had, we had five million extra dollars this year that we needed. Uh, or was it five billion? Yeah, billion, yeah, billion, billion, five billion. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Jeremy. All right, so we've got, we're, we're a little over, but I want to get to the last two questions I saw. We got one in the middle, and I think we had one over here. Is that right? So if you guys will ask, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this thing up. So go ahead. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Mike, Mike. Oh, I mean, my answer is quick. I, I like, I think it's, uh, I think there is a role at the same time, um, you know, you're combining two very progressive, um, you know, not fully understood industries. So there's conversations happening, but I think, you know, it, what usually ends up happening is it's more complicated than it probably is, you know, uh, valid at this point. So down the road, I could see something, uh, I mean, us personally, you mentioned like the cash, there are solutions out there like private label credit cards that we're working with that can, uh, you know, solve uh, some of the cash issues. So that's uh, something that's probably more relevant right now in terms of that from my standpoint than crypto. Yeah, from what I've been explained by somebody in the NFT market internationally, cryptocurrency, if it gets forward to where they expect it, literally every store, Gap, Publix, whatever, would have their own coin and you could buy those coins, which maybe some are not. I mean, it's just such a complicated industry and where it's headed, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, Trueleaf could have their own current coin and stuff. Are y'all looking into that? Uh, no. Okay. But there, there are, but there are companies that will have kind of their own internal guest card that they would put money on so that they, it's not a cash issue that, that, that will do it. There are some innovative uh, places, as you probably know, the ATMs out in California where you don't get cash out, you get a voucher out that you can then turn in 
uh, for the purchase. That way it's not a cash issue. Um, and they've gotten pretty clever with it. The crypto though, like, like Jordan said, I don't, it, it, heck, we're just trying to get to use ATMs, you know, <laughs> you know forget everything else. And then we had one last one over here. It's a federal crime to do it, so no, don't. I, ideas. Do you mean best ideas practices? on how to do it? Ideas. Yeah, it's Not a federal crime. Got so it. I, uh, let's talk a, later. He, he's saying on a Mike on a best practices basis. I can only say it's a federal crime to do it. Bring it over state. I don't think he's talking about. He's talking, he's talking about, about the, 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 like as far as far as the policy is concerned. Oh, Not policy. about like yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, even if we legalize it in our state, it's still a federal law. So hey, somebody yeah, else has something. No, no, just what policies would work best here that we've learned that we've seen states. elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy, you think you, Jordan, I mean, Jordan. you think you can best answer that based on what you've seen in other states, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it really, I mean, my answer would be similar to what I said earlier about, you know, a combination of, uh, you know, the social justice, economic empowerment pieces. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, like in cannabis right now, vertically integrated companies, ones that, you know, manufacture, grow, and, and retail are the most profitable companies. Um, you know, it's, so it's, th that is a model that's working very well right now, but then you look at, you know, other industries, very rarely do you have the retailers that are also the manufacturers and the distributors. So it's something that's going to evolve over time. It's, so it's really unclear. Georgia actually has a pretty unique situation that a lot of other states don't have. And what hasn't been mentioned is, as well, yes, as truly we, we are able to grow, we're able to process, and we have five dispensaries that we, will, we would open up. Uh, but you also have a part where the pharmacy or the board of pharmacy is able to issue licenses as well. And I think that's where you'll see some of the entrepreneurships available you know, here, those are not controlled by, by any of the others. Those are separate licenses that are given. I think there might be a cap on how many can be given out, but um, that's still another option here that is uh, truly cannot own any of those uh, pharmacies that, that would be out there. So that, those are opportunities that are available. But as far as other policies, I think that would work really well here is getting started. You know, we, it's a, <laughs> instead of delaying this, you know, and I think there are probably six pretty decent companies and, 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 and I, I kid on that a little bit, but I will say, and a lot of people have an issue with maybe how some of that was done, but you have to also realize truly is the only multi-state operator that was awarded a license. Everybody else is local. And in most other states, every time that happens, it's the opposite. It's always these outside companies that were given all of the licenses and one may be given to a local company. And so I, I think the process actually worked in this case. Well, guys, I, we'll, do we'll you have one more thing you want to add? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's just, uh, I'm not sure local will be the best way to define the other licenses, but that's not important today. I just want to say thank you for, for a really enlightening conversation. I think that uh, we could probably go on for hours talking about this topic because it's something that we're really just scratching the surface on here, and, and there's so much dialogue about it. I also want to thank all of you for coming out. I, I was talking to somebody before we got started up here on the panel. I can't remember the last time uh, I came to a breakfast event You know, at 7.15 a.m. It's been years and years and years, maybe since December 2019. So. Thank you guys all for Thank coming you. out and supporting this group, but also supporting uh, Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta. <laughs> Thank you to you gentlemen for, for taking your time to share with us and answer some of our questions. Uh, everyone's welcome to hang out a little bit longer and enjoy more breakfast if you want to. And I uh, hope you guys will join us May 24th, which is gonna be the, the next installment of the Breakfast Casual series. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the general state of business in Georgia. So thank you everybody and hope you enjoyed it. Excellent. That Excellent. was really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah.